To me, this is the big question. Planet Earth, Spaceship Earth, um, Mother Earth, you can call it a lot of things. We should, probably should have called it Planet Water, since 70% of it is covered by oceans and rivers and lakes. But what an amazing home it is. And what an amazing place to call home. We don't steer it, we don't spin it. Uh, we, we definitely have a big impact on it, increasingly so. But one thing that's so important to remember is that Mother Nature has designed the playing field in, in which we need to live. And she has set the rules of the game, whether we like it or not. But unfortunately, I think that we're forgetting that in our society today. And as I've journeyed around the world, um, I've, I've had some incredible experiences. And one of them was a day in Papua New Guinea on an island called Pentecost. And what happened that day has shaped me to, to a large extent in my, my worldview. Because every May, in er, the early part of May, the men and the boys jump off these towers made of sticks and vines with not a nail or a screw in them. And they, just before they crash headfirst into the earth, the vines stop them. But unlike a bungee, they don't spring gently back up. They're literally jerked to a halt. And they try to get dirt on their nose. That's how close they come to the earth. And 28 men and boys jump. I asked the chief at the end of the day, why do you do this? And the chief, half naked, looked at me and said, well, Jeffrey, it's so that our yams will grow better this year. <laughs> Giant potatoes, staple crop. Well, of course, that makes sense. <laughs> but it's come to symbolize to me that Aboriginal culture's connection to nature. So, much, so strong that they felt they needed to sacrifice their life for their harvest. And that's a connection. I'm not saying we should all go jump off towers, but we need to re remember that nature, clean air, clean water, clean food have to be top priorities. I've had a lot of other adventures. This is a macaroni penguin. If you're wondering what it's like to hug one, it's like holding a muscular rugby ball that bites, regurgitates, and poos on you nonstop. It's not very pleasant. Um, you're not supposed to touch the penguins, but I was working with some scientists. From polar bears to penguins, the king, the queen of the Arctic, I, I've, I've fallen in love with the polar regions. And that's where I've spent the better part of my, my last 20 years. And, and why are they important? There's so many reasons. They're, they're the cornerstones of this planet. They drive our climate system. They very much are like the batteries of a car. If the two poles aren't connected, the car doesn't start. And the polar regions, um, allow us to live here the, uh, as, a, as a human species in the environment that we need. Cut, cut, they're really cute and cuddly until they try to eat you. Um, this one we <laughs> was trying to climb onto our sailboat, so we stuck a GoPro up its nose and that was that. Um, uh, you know, there's so many natural wonders and, and I think awe and wonder are two things we need to be healthy and we don't get it from television, we only get it from nature. Um, it doesn't have to be here, it can be in the Gatineau Park, but this is the world's largest seabird, the wandering albatross with a wingspan from tip to tip of four meters and a head as big as yours and they can live to be 80 years old. And an amazing species that we share planet Earth with along with humpback whales and all the whales including the biggest things that have ever lived on planet Earth, the blue whale. But increasingly, besides those natural wonders, uh, the cultural wonders have, have fascinated me. And this is an Inuk elder from the Canadian Arctic. He was born in an igloo, and at the end of his life, he was surfing the internet. From igloos to internet in a single generation, the biggest change of any culture in the history of the world in that period of time, and it's happening in our backyard. And along with that, of course, come in tremendous challenges but there's also a lot of really wonderful things happening as, as, uh, as we speak uh, right now. For all these reasons and many more, I, as an educator and an adventurer, I thought, man, let's take youth to these parts of our world at the beginning of their life. So I started Students on Ice 18 years ago, SOI. We've been going strong ever since. We've taken 3,000 students from 55 countries to both the Arctic and the Antarctic. We use ships as our floating classrooms, and we take experts in all different walks of life to mentor and teach and share with the, with the students. 
And we had a, a, a wonderful student here from Ashbury with us this past summer. We're hoping to bring more Ashbury students with us in the future. Um, this didn't really work. Uh, we tried to get the students to pull us through the ice, but it, it, uh, we didn't get too far. <laughs> but we get out every day, we're touching, we're, we're smelling, we're, we're feeling, we're sitting down and soaking it in. We're just experiencing that unbelievable beauty, like the, the true sculptures of Mother Nature, icebergs. Um, this is the Antarctic, and I mean, it's just totally, it's like going to another planet and looking back at Earth. And, and bridging those cultural um, differences is such a big journey we're on right now, particularly here in Canada as we explore reconciliation and what does that really mean? Um, uh, it, we're bringing about 40% indigenous youth on our programs. So it's a group of students from north, south, east, west together like Ashbury, but on a ship in the Arctic. Bringing back cultural practices like kayaks. We forget how much we've learned and taken from the indigenous cultures of the world, not even giving them their credit, like the incredible invention of a kayak. Students are involved in hands-on science research, and uh, including ice coring, where we're learning about that climactic history of planet Earth through the cores, like the rings of a tree, the layers of the ice caps of, the, of planet Earth are teaching us a lot. And then we analyze those back on the ship. And we connect different, everybody connects differently to nature. Sometimes it's through art, sometimes it's through music, sometimes it's through science. So we're really exploring all of those different venues. And mental health is actually becoming a big component of our program, um, which is, is uh, I, I think, a sign of the times. Uh, in, in many different ways and a sign of what our youth are experiencing today. We see climate change firsthand, like here stuck in melted permafrost. Even the plants that, that our botanists are, are, are studying, they're seeing changes in a very short period of time in the Arctic. The tree line's moving further north. There's new bugs, there's new fish. Um, orca whales are moving more and more into the north. Um, but. Of course, the biggest change we're seeing is ice. Glacier ice and sea ice. Um, as you hear all the time, it is diminishing. This was an experience on the Arctic flow edge, where you're on the frozen Arctic Ocean at the edge of the open Arctic Ocean. And it was time to go, and the students were procrastinating, and they said, let's have a group hug, so we're in the middle of a group hug, and then one of the students said, there's a whale, and right at the edge of the ice, a bowhead whale surfaced, the biggest whale in the Arctic. And it was like a submarine that surfaced beside us and the students all walked up to the edge of the ice. And you could hear this whale breathing. And after a few minutes, it took this deep breath. Whoo! You felt it in your bones and it dove under the ice and disappeared right under our feet. And one of the students, we we're all in shock, said, that whale came to deliver us a message to take what we've learned and go home and make a difference. And they did. They petitioned the federal government for two years. They wrote letters, they did campaigns, and eventually they were part of the, a new national wildlife area on Baffin Island to protect bowhead whales. Another amazing day with whales was here where orcas were hunting seals. They would make waves to knock the seals into the ocean and catch the seals. Unbelievable hunting technique. We thought, tough day for those seals. What happened next was all the whales left, all three seals jumped back up onto the ice, totally unharmed. The whales are teaching their young to hunt, playing with the seals and letting them go. Sustainable fishing by orca. Why, if they can do it, why the hell can't we? We can learn from mother nature. And one of the young, just like maybe some of our students in class not always paying attention, wanted to check the humans out, that whale put its chin on the back of that zodiac and looked up into the eyes of all the students with me. In that moment, I mean, we were freaking out, we were in shock, but we, we connected to nature in a way that nobody in that boat will ever forget. Have we found it all? No, there's so much to discover, which makes this one of the most exciting times, especially for our youth, especially for you, you students out there, because yeah, we've dis we know the world's not flat, we, we know where most things are, but now what? 
Now we need to learn to live sustainably on planet Earth. We need new technologies and energies and policies and forms of education and so much more. We need new young explorers. The new Shackletons and Amelia Earharts are going to be um, those of us pushing boundaries and being ambitious and, and trying to figure out the balance we need on, on, to live on this planet no matter where we are. And I'm lucky to get to know a lot of these students that are out there making those changes now. Eden started her own NGO. It's based in New York and India. She's making solar panels that also filter fresh water in Africa, uh, uh, communities primarily and now in India. Sun Yi came up to me and said, I want to write a book about climate change when we were in the Arctic. I said, great, Sun Yi, you should do that. She was 16 years old. A year and a half later, a box arrived at my office with 100 copies of her book published by Chi the, the Chinese Science Press. I can't read a word of it because it's all in Chinese, but it's pretty amazing. that. She, and now she's, she's uh, exploring how to reduce traffic congestion in China. This young man from uh, Nunavut has started a, a project to monitor sea ice and make sure it's safe for the hunters to go out on by using time-lapse lapse photography in this community. Absolutely amazing, catching attention of all kinds of investors. Robert Adragna from Toronto has uh, started a polar, a, a poles, a protect the poles, protect the planet conference now in its second year. And this is the future of the Arctic for me. And, and this is who cares about the Arctic because it's their home. Matali Okulik and this incredible young gal, the first student from her community that's graduated from high school and gone to university in over a decade from Baker Lake. And they are inspiring future leaders of our north that give a uh, great cause for hope for all of us. Matsuli is the president of the National Inuit Youth Council and just came back yesterday from Marrakesh at the COP22 climate change meetings, standing up for the rights of Inuit. I was in New York City two years ago for the 400,000 person march. Uh, absolutely an amazing experience. And I, I took this photo and <laughs> Dr. Seuss had all the answers, I think. The Lorax, I live in Chelsea, Quebec, and two years ago they were gonna put a septic sludge sewage treatment plant on the Gatineau River, great idea. And I sent a, a copy of the Lorax to all eight mayors in the municipality. I don't know what, if that helped, but that there's no septic sludge sewage treatment plant. <laughs> I wanted to close on a, a project that I just wanted to share with you. Um, you know, why is the Arctic important? Who cares about it? We should, as Canadians. 40% of the Arctic is in Canada. We have the largest Arctic coastline of any country in the world. We, um, we are a polar nation. And no matter where we live, or what you know about the Arctic, it has impacted you. It shapes our identity as a country and as a, as a people. If we, had, if we didn't have a vast border stretching all the way to the North Pole, we would be a different people. Um, and so next year's our 150th anniversary. It's pretty amazing that this school's been here almost that long. And we're gonna sail this ship all the way around Canada, starting on June 1st in Toronto. 150 day journey all the way out to St. Lawrence, around the Maritimes, up through the Northwest Passage, around Alaska, down to Victoria on October 28th. It's a journey divided into 15 10 day legs. And on each leg of the journey, we're going to bring a cross section of Canadian society scientists, youth, innovators, politicians, musicians, artists, indigenous leaders, newcoming, newcomer Canadians and tell stories. It's a voyage of celebration. It's going to be a, a voyage of reconciliation. And it's going to be a voyage of science and education. And hopefully something that will help us look about, look to where we want to go. We want to celebrate the past, but where do we want to be as a country? Um, and what are the opportunities ahead of us? So I'm really excited about that. And lastly, a guy that stood on this stage a few times who passed away, a great Canadian, Dr. Fred Roots. Um, he was a pioneer and we stand on his shoulders in so many ways. And he would say things like, at times your nerve and your verve must serve 
in a game where you take your chances. And another of my favorite people who's no longer here is Sir Ernest Shackleton. And on the back of his headstone in Gritviken, South Georgia, is a Robert Browning poem. And it says, a person should strive to their uttermost for their life set prize. Which in today's lingo means, just go for it. <laughs> and that's what we all need to do um, because we're so fortunate to, to have the chance to do so.